Uh, I'm just by way of uh, housekeeping, I, I was actually not the first person that Stu asked to speak to you tonight. Um, he had uh, attempted to get Lou Dobbs to come this evening, but um, <laughs> as Lou is still contemplating a run for political office in New Jersey, he's been holding a series of post Cinco de Mayo parties for the workers on his farm in the southern Jersey, so he couldn't make it tonight. Um, and then Stu tried to get uh, Kramer, but today's his medication holiday, so he can't be here either. <laughs> so it, it, it will be us. Um, Obviously, there is a lot going on. Uh, before I came up, I was uh, checking my uh, news feed from CNBC, our internal feed, and it does appear that as, as much as uh, there was some optimism uh, over the last couple of days about negotiations, uh, House Speaker Boehner has pulled out rather abruptly. Uh, Dow futures are down about 300 points this evening, so it may be a very rocky day uh, tomorrow. So actually, that's not at all true. I'm just playing with you and um, <laughs> want to see if you're paying attention. So. Um, <laughs> For those of you with pacemakers, I apologize. Um, <laughs> you, you bought it for a minute, though, didn't you? Yeah. Works every time, by the way. I, I do this in every speech, and everybody gasps. I love it. Um, I, I have, have had a, a as, as Mark said, you know, it's been associated with CNBC now for uh, 22 years, and before that, I was with Financial News Network out in Los Angeles, which was the first uh, all-day uh, business television network in the country. Uh, started there quite by accident. I was a film major at Cal State Northridge in Southern California. Uh, when I graduated, neither Steven Spielberg nor George Lucas bothered to call, and so uh, I had a problem with gainful employment. Uh, fortunately, a friend of mine from high school, Casey Wyan, who's still a reporter for CNN, uh, was working at Financial News Network, something I'd never heard of. He'd gone from uh, journalism school at USC over to FNN. And I called him and asked him if they had any openings, and he got me a job as an entry-level uh, production assistant. Uh, in uh, June of 1984, about a week out of college. And so I went over there having absolutely no familiarity with business or news for that matter. Uh, worked there for about four months, uh, was summarily dismissed uh, four months after I got there. My executive producer walked over to me and said, and I was making $50 a day, no benefits at the time. I was just a freelance production assistant. And the gentleman came over to me and said, remember when I told you I needed you next week? Uh, I don't need you next week. And so I went back to the vitamin store where I worked in college. Uh, looked around for gainful employment. Four months after that, because FNN went through a massive cutback the week after I was laid off and whacked 90% of the editorial staff, leaving my friend Casey as a producer, uh, Bill Griffith and Sue Verrera, who you know from CNBC, uh, both of whom remained as our full-time anchors, ad-libbing eight hours of live business news television a day between them. And that was uh, where we, we left off when I, when I departed the firm. They had a couple of contributors. Uh, my friend Casey, as I said, stayed as a producer. Four months later, he calls me up, asked me if I wanted a job as a producer, which I took immediately. And uh, not having found anything on the entertainment side of the business. And three months after that, Bill and Sue, who had been sharing eight hours, again, of live television every day between them, called in sick on the same day. And an enlightened young producer there gave me my first chance to go on air and do a couple of reports. Uh, the fact that I happen to have been that producer is probably immaterial for the purposes of this conversation, but um, it was a very thinly populated operation. I was the only person in the room. And in May of 1985, I got on the air. And by September, I was a full-time anchor with very little knowledge of the anchoring process and no knowledge of markets or economics. And as you can see from today's television, not much has changed when it comes to people who are on TV. Um, but in truth, it was a, an accidental career. Uh, I, I, I never intended to be in financial news uh, by any stretch of the imagination. That things happened the way they happened and I, as people say, I was in the right place at the right time and caught the growth curve uh, that started with Financial News Network many years ago and ultimately morphed into to CNBC. We merged in 1991 and uh, it's been an extraordinary ride. I mean, I have seen every major financial crisis since the mid-1980s. I've covered events that I never expected to cover from 9-11 uh, to uh, G8 meetings outside the country to a whole host of other events, uh, the World Economic Forum and what have you. And again, rather accidentally, one of the most transformational and profound moments I had as, as a business journalist uh, was another accidental experience. I was visiting a friend of mine in Chicago uh, who I'd known since uh, elementary school who was at Northwestern uh, studying medicine. And I went out to hang with him for a week. I'd really never spent any time with Chicago and in Chicago. Decided to go out there. And at the time at FNN, we were doing a Monday morning program called the Options Report in conjunction with the Chicago Board Options Exchange every Monday morning at 1030. And the CBOE was offering an options trading class as well the week that I was going out. So I asked Bill Griffith, who at the time was my boss, if I could take this options trading class, do a report on our Monday morning show, 
and then uh, basically right off the trip while I was out there visiting my friend and he said yes and so I went and it turned out that the morning that I went to start tra taking this options trading class and prepare uh, a live report for FNN was Monday October 19th 1987 uh, largest stock market crash in the history of the United States and I happened to be on the floor of a major exchange as the market was crashing. I ended up working 12 hours a day for the entire week in Chicago covering the crash which at the time we thought was going to usher in the next Great Depression. I mean for those of you who don't remember uh, the Dow fell 23 percent in a single day. It was 508 points which at that time was an extraordinary day. Um, and the fact that the Federal Reserve intervened so decisively at the time effectively set the stage for what was a pattern of policy responses in the financial markets that we are still dealing with today that have uh, effectively in many cases quarantined Wall Street and inoculated Main Street from the types of problems that we've seen over and over again since 1987. And it was interesting because it was also Alan Greenspan's first two months on the job as chairman of the Federal Reserve. Uh, people probably have forgotten this. He was named chairman to replace Paul Volcker in August of 1987. Uh, the Dow peaked on August 25th of 1987 at the quaint number of 2722 and change. Promptly fell a thousand points in the next two months. Greenspan's immediate response to the crash was to lower interest rates, infuse the economy with money, backstop the banks, the banks backstop the brokers, the brokers backstop the specialists and market makers. And we got out of this thing, shockingly enough, with only a Wall Street recession. There was no recession on Main Street because the Fed responded so forcefully to a financial market crisis. Since 1987, we have had what uh, market observers like to call Six Sigma events, these uh, black swans, fat tail events, every two years. Now statistically they're supposed to happen once every 23,000 years. And they've happened every two years since 1987. <laughs> And in each of those instances, the Fed has responded in very similar fashion by providing liquidity, cutting interest rates. And so the banking crisis that you may remember from the early 1990s that result of bad leverage buyout loans and commercial real estate overbuilding and things like that, again, softened by the Fed's response to the crisis, lowering interest rates, very mild recession, relatively speaking, in the early 90s. We had Orange County go bankrupt in 1994 in the Mexican peso crisis that year. Again, the Fed eased the way out of that. We had the Asian currency crisis, the collapse of Russia and long-term capital in 97 and 98. We had the bursting of the internet bubble in 2000 and the effects of 9-11, all of which received the same response from the Federal Reserve until we came upon uh, this most recent crisis that we had, which by every measure what was the deepest since the 1930s. Uh, and, and for the first time in this 25-year experience, Main Street suffered as badly and in some cases worse than Wall Street. We were all levered to the same asset, to residential real estate. The subprime uh, boom was uh, unique in its construction. It was pervasive throughout the economy. We had a national real estate bubble. We had a credit market bubble that was enormous in size. The derivatives business grew to be $750 trillion. And once that fuse was lit, and once, as Warren Buffett once called them, those weapons of mass financial destruction began to go off, we experienced something that we have not seen in several generations. And again, the Fed came with a forceful response. Uh, but there were so many causes for this. And the reason I go back over this, this um, experience is it's, it's relevant to my, very relevant to the future outlook, I think, because people still have some misunderstanding of, of what actually transpired during that period uh, insofar as we came extraordinarily close, and I think closer than most people realize, to going headlong into an extraordinarily deep crisis. The Fed's actions under Ben Bernanke, which were truly heroic, uh, kept us from going into the second Great Depression of a hundred year time span. And, and, and it's interesting to kind of look back on the situation as it developed and understand the antecedents and also the response. Uh, part of the problem, obviously, was we immediately after the internet bubble found another asset that we thought would continue to rise in value in perpetuity. And it was, it was a remarkable experience that it occurred so quickly after the internet bubble had burst. But we decided that real estate was an asset that would advance uh, for the rest of our lives. And it was done so on very low interest rates, very available credit, as, as was referenced earlier, um, and also an enormous alteration in the process of credit creation. Uh, credit was extremely easy. It was not only cheap, but it was easy to obtain. 
we got to the point where these things called ninja loans, no income, no job loans, were created. Uh, they were also called liar loans. You needed no documentation uh, to get a house. You needed no prior address to get your next address. Things got way out of hand. And some of this was in response to really uh, a, a political goal, it started in the Clinton administration, the spread of the Bush administration, of maximizing home ownership in the United States. And we did get there, 69%, highest level ever. But most of it came uh, from the notion that everyone should own a home, whether or not he or she could afford it. And the process of risk management during that entire period actually fell to the wayside. As individuals, we stopped analyzing whether or not we could afford this house that we were buying. And if, under adverse circumstances, we had an adjustable rate mortgage and interest rates went up, we didn't really bother to think about what the consequences would be if the Fed would raise rates 17 times in a two-year period and suddenly your adjustable mortgage that was a partial interest only uh, piece of paper not only had full interest due, but then principal payments on top of that. You're out of your home in 30 days. Uh, institutions failed to take into account risk when they were analyzing their own situation. Banks in the United States were capitalized at 28 to 35 times their capital base, or levered, I should say. And we had the derivatives markets, and we had supervisors who literally failed to oversee the entire system during this period of excess. And, and I thought a lot about the risk management process. I happened to have been working at, at a hedge fund at the time, and so we had some, I think, rather unique insights into the depths of the crisis. And, and during this period, November of 2008, um, I was out giving a speech in Las Vegas uh, to a gaming group, and Lehman had already collapsed, AIG had already gone, and uh, I was out in, in Vegas, and it was already getting hit far worse than the rest of the country. And this was November of 2008. And I was going out on my 13th wedding anniversary to give a speech. My wife was going to join me, but we couldn't get enough babysitter coverage. She stayed behind. I went to Vegas to give the speech. And I got out there, and it was immediately apparent that Vegas was already in a very, very deep recession before the rest of the country. As soon as I landed, my driver told me, as we were on our way to the Hilton, that his business was down 20 or 30 percent. Walked into the Hilton, you could shoot a cannon off in this place and not hit a soul. The gaming business was down 20%. The convention business was down 20 Attendance was down 40 And this was just after we had really got into the beginning stages, the deepest stages of the crisis. And it was kind of shocking to me because I also noticed that the other entertainment industry most intimately associated with Las Vegas seems to have fallen on hard times as well. As, as I looked around the room, I noticed I was one of the only men uh, in the Hilton and it was my 13th wedding anniversary I decided to kill some time at the slot machines let me be clear about this um, because I had a 13 million dollar payout so it was my 13th wedding anniversary 13 million dollars I thought things were lining up quite nicely for me that evening um, but I had noticed also uh, and it's been told to me by others uh, that when you're in Las Vegas this particular form of entertainment cannot be offered to you directly uh, that's what I've been told uh, and so I was sitting at the slot machines and in the pace, uh, this period of two hours, I was solicited five times in rather no uncertain terms. Such was the economic crisis in Las Vegas. And in each case, I politely declined, pointing out that I was married. And it was also my anniversary, which would make it even more tacky, I guess. Um, <laughs> and at the very end of the evening, I was going up to my room, and I was approached again by an attractive young lady. And she asked me if I wanted any entertainment. And I said, no, thank you very much. And she looked at me and she said, by the way, aren't you on MSNBC? And I said, yes, I'm Keith Oberman. Nice to meet you. And um, <laughs> this was when the notion of risk management set in my mind in a very solid and concrete manner. If you have the opportunity to avoid a crisis, it's best to be proactive. And uh, given my situation, and if you don't want to be on page six in the New York Post, you pass on that. Uh, opportunity for lack of a better expression. But one thing that we didn't do during this period of time was to pay attention to the attendant risks that had built in the system. Whether it was individuals, again, institutions, or supervisors, no one was paying attention to the risk. And we ultimately paid a rather hefty price uh, for that lack of risk management.